All right, so I'll, so I'll hand it over to you, Oleg. So get started whenever you like. Perfect. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you good. I'm just going to mute this mic so that we don't have any feedback, but you're coming yeah. through loud and clear. Perfect. OK, I will start then. Uh, interrupt me uh, if, if something uh, you can hear me or something like this. Uh, so hi, everybody. My name is Oleg. Uh, and I'm a creator of uh, GraphQL Scala implementation, which is uh, which is called Sangria. Um I will share my screen uh, with my presentation slides, and we'll move on. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep, we can see it. Perfect. Okay. So um, GraphQL. Um, I thought. I thought that uh, before I introduce you to GraphQL, uh, it makes sense to explain a little bit uh, where it came from and uh, what is the purpose, what kind of problems it tries to solve. Um, so I wanted first to look to, to the REST API, uh, something that we uh, use, uh, like most of us are familiar with it, and, and even, uh, even most of us probably work with it on a daily basis. Uh, and typical request, um, looks like this. So you make a GET request to, to your server, um, to a REST API, and then um, server accepts it, and uh, maybe it looks up into it was in, it in the database. Uh, in this case, we ask for a product, um, and we go to the database, and um, uh, database is just an example. It can be a service. It can be anything. But for the sake of simplicity and for this example, I just chosen database. So. After, the, after it came from the database, we actually get a product, which we give back to the client. Uh, and as you can see, you, the client backs, uh, gets back uh, something that you would normally expect, something with ID and version and name. And you probably will see a lot of uh, properties here, like, I don't know, 20, 40 properties, uh, just, just normal product object. Um, I would argue that there are some problems with this approach. Um, for one, uh, one of the problems is, is our data overfetching. Um, and what I mean by this is uh, that uh, what clients back, uh, clients, uh, client gets back as a response uh, is a product object which is uh, uh, <clears throat> big. It, it can be very big. Uh, so for example, uh, I saw uh, responses, especially when it comes to product lists, with one megabyte or even bigger. Um, but what is uh, what is uh, more important? Client gets a lot of information that it actually doesn't need. Uh, like if if um, a client wants to present uh, some particular view or some particular uh, like product detail page, uh, it probably will need about I don't know fifty percent of the properties uh, that were returned by the server. Um, so for some it may be acceptable, but uh, for for some project uh, projects and projects that I worked on. It's kind of a problem, especially if you go mobile and you would like to give responses to a mobile application. So what people do normally is uh, they come up with, uh, with a solution to a problem. And this is a quite typical solution to, to this kind of problem, where you introduce uh, uh, some query parameters that allow you to filter particular fields, like in this case, a name, description, and then something a little bit strange. Uh, so it sounds a little bit it looks a little bit unfamiliar and it is it's kind of a, a JSON itself is um, can be pretty complex like it contains objects with uh, lists with objects uh, so this deeply nested structure and you need uh, some kind of language to, to be able to um, kind of dive deeper inside of this object and um, uh, try to describe this kind of data requirements so client needs to be able to describe this. So people invent different languages for this, like in this example. So this language is, you're probably don't, not familiar with it, probably <laughs> nobody familiar with it, except people who actually worked, uh, implemented it in, in the first place, in, in particular project or in particular company. Um, another problem is uh, underfetching. Uh, even though the response that I shown uh, has a lot of properties, um, and maybe some of them are used, maybe some of them are, are not used, but the thing is that uh, most probably a client it, it would be not enough for client. Um, I saw many cases where client actually needs to make additional requests, especially with with um, popularity of um, REST API and um, hypermedia API. Especially, you have a lot of links uh, when you get when you get back a response from the server. 
uh, you expected to follow the links if you need to fetch additional information, which means uh, additional round trips to the server. So for some clients, it can be acceptable. Um, for some, it may be not acceptable. Again, especially in it uh, no, unnecessary request to the server. So what people do normally, and this is uh, what I personally worked with, so this is um, part of the API or kind of a syntax that, for example, I, I worked on, on my project. Um, you, you kind of provide the client the possibility to expand on a particular object. So if I ask for a product, I can uh, expand on product type, and I will get two objects uh, inside of response body. This is kind of a neat way to, to fetch a lot of information in one request. Um, but the problem is that this kind of approach, again, it's, it's completely custom. Uh, I haven't saw any well-accepted uh, standards or solutions that are used across different projects. Um, and um, so people invent their own, and every time you need to communicate with some particular API from uh, some particular project uh, or some service, uh, you need to learn their language for, for this kind of stuff. Um, and it, it kind of uh, gets a little bit annoying. So the last problem that I would like to discuss is this evolution of the API. Uh, I think it's, it's a big topic and it's an important topic. And unfortunately, uh, what people normally do, they introduce uh, things like um, a versioning. And versioning uh, is uh, kind of solves this problem, but it's uh, very hard to maintain. Um, so I, I will think always, I always will think twice before introducing versioning into the project uh, because you need to maintain all of the past versions. So and uh, you also need to answer questions like, for how long are we able or we have um, uh, or we can uh, to uh, support all the versions of API. Um, it, uh, at, the end of, at the end of the day, it comes down to the cost. It, it, is, um, uh, it, it requires a lot of effort to support different versions. Another way uh, how you can handle this is you can um, introduce a deprecation uh, for, for your API. But here comes another, uh, kind of we come back to the same problem. Uh, when client asks for a product, um, it asks for the whole product. It has no kind of ability to, to say, okay, I don't want the whole product, I want only part of the product. Um, and that's because server sends always the whole product. Um, and for server, it's impossible to tell which fields are actually used uh, and which are not used. And for client, it's impossible to tell which fields it needs or not. Um, if, if you don't use uh, any of the custom solutions that I described before. Um, uh, so um, this, this kind of knowledge will help a lot for, uh, in this, uh, during, during the server development because you know you can duplicate a field and you can watch whether somebody um, stops using it or uh, you still have clients that need this field so you can't really remove it yet. Um, <clears throat> out of this uh, frustration, and um, uh, just to kind of uh, solve this problem, uh, or because of some of those frustra frustrations, um, people uh, so, so new patterns emerge. Like for example, API gateway. An API gateway is kind of twofold pattern. Uh, on one hand, it provides uh, this kind of unified view on uh, your backend API. Uh, what is shown here in this particular slide um, is um, are, are different services, uh, but it can be anything. So for example, it can be uh, Elasticsearch or some kind of database. Um, it should necessarily be an internal service. Um, and then API Gateway provides this kind of unified view on all of those different APIs that are implemented by uh, internal services and gives this kind of nice um, uh, bigger uh, company API or service API, uh, which is just one API. But it turns out that um, you have different clients and uh, moreover, you have different types of clients with different requirements. For example, mobile applications and browser uh, in, on a desktop uh, are different. Uh, they have different data requirements. Uh, they have different network conditions. So what would be acceptable for, for a de desktop application, like for example, fetching uh, multiple uh, 
uh, making m multiple requests to, to show one page um, for mobile applications may, may not be acceptable, um, especially if it sits, for example, in background. Uh, it only gets opportunity to talk to the server once in half an hour, and even then it's able to make one request. So in this, in this one request, it should be able uh, to fully uh, to, to get all of the information it needs to function. Um, and it becomes a problem. So what people do, people define different custom endpoints for different types of clients. Um, this, this works. Uh, but the problem is that those endpoints are custom. So you need to maintain all of them. And they, even though they give uh, kind of the same data, uh, the same kind of data, but uh, they give it in different form, a little bit different form. So um, uh, this becomes a kind of a problem to manage all of those custom endpoints, even though you are working with the same kind of data. Uh, especially if you do versioning, it becomes even much worse. Um, and uh, exactly those kind of problems, uh, uh, also people at Facebook, faced when they um, were developing um, GraphQL. So GraphQL, uh, what GraphQL allows you to do is uh, the same kind of pattern. So you, you ask a server for particular data, like for a product, with a small difference. Um, what you, you uh, a client actually able to describe all of, the, all of its data requirements in form of GraphQL query. So in this example, um, you make a request to a GraphQL endpoint, uh, and you ask for a product with the name and description, as shown at the, at the bottom. Um, so it does exactly the same. So it asks the database, and database gives back a response. And GraphQL server gives back a response to the client in form of JSON. <laughs> but, but this JSON contains only properties that the client actually asked. Uh, for example, here you see a product name and description. So what um, GraphQL, GraphQL actually is, is, it's a data query language. It was developed by Facebook, and um, it was uh, used at Facebook in general uh, for about three years now. It was open source this uh, July, and then followed up by release of uh, Relay. And Relay is um, um, a React framework uh, that um, um, highly coupled with GraphQL, and um, it uses GraphQL to specify that requirements um, for your React application, and all of those requirements are collected in, in one efficient request sent to the server, and then all of the ne necessary data for all of the components on the page would be rendered and uh, would be delivered by the server in one response. Um, and another important thing about GraphQL is that uh, it is a specification. So this means that um, uh, GraphQL, there, there are some implementations of GraphQL, like in JavaScript, in Python, in, in Scala, of course. But on its core, GraphQL is specification, uh, and it enables all of those implementations on, on the client and on the server to uh, efficiently work with each other. And I think it is a very important of Kafka, a very important aspect of Kafka because I don't think that um, libraries like um, Sankaya uh, would exist without this uh, specification. So um, now I thought that uh, I will describe you Kafka a little bit. So I describe some of the, its features too. Uh, because it's a new technology. I, I think uh, most of you are not familiar with, with the language itself, or maybe you just heard about it. Um, so I wanted to give um, a little bit of you what, what GraphQL is, what it allows you to do. And then I will show you um, how you can implement it on, in your Scala application, uh, like, um, uh, for example, in Play application or Akka HTTP application. Um, so, uh, important thing in GraphQL is kind of a fundamental part of GraphQL is that your request always mirrors the, the response structure. So as you can see here, I ask for a product uh, with the name and description, with the picture with size and height of this picture and URL. And what I get back as a response is actually uh, the same kind of structure. So I get 
a product in response, which has a name and description properties, picture, price, and has. Um, and this is a nice aspect because uh, you don't need to guess what would be the response because uh, you sent a query and you already know the, the structure of response. Um, but what, what if I want a different kind of picture? So for example, 150 size is nice, but it's not very suitable in my particular application, for instance. Well, it's not a problem because fields can actually have arguments. <clears throat> uh, so effectively, you can treat every single field as a function. Like in this case, for example, I asked for, not for just for a picture, but a picture of particular size. And what I get is actually a picture of this particular size. Um, but what, what if I want different sizes? So I want picture with different sizes. Like in this, in, for example, I have uh, my product detail page and I show a small thumbnail of a picture uh, followed by uh, a bigger picture, so like a full size picture. Well, um, uh, this is possible as well. So you, you can define an address for a field and um, this allows you to use the same field multiple times with a different name, uh, but with different arguments. Like in this case, I actually asked for a thumbnail and for a full-size picture. And I think, um, in my opinion, this is those two combination of those two features gives a lot of flexibility and a lot of power to the client. Um, for example, in this case, uh, it's possible, and this is what people often do. They uh, kind of make implement this kind of logic on the client side, where a client knows the structure of the picture URL and tries to concatenate different parts of the picture um, in order to achieve, uh, in order to get URL for particular picture size. Um, but it's problematic on from different sides. Um, ideally, you would like to centralize this kind of logic, and uh, with GraphQL, it's very very easy to do. Uh, because well, when you ask for a picture, you can actually ask for a particular picture. So you can encapsulate this kind of URI, uh, URL building logic on the server side and expose this uh, to, to a client via a field. Um, and another big feature, a uh, big feature of uh, GraphQL. Um, uh, of GraphQL is that um, it's entirely based on a type system. And it, it may uh, look even familiar to, to Scala and very appealing to a Scala community, I think, because Scala also have very powerful type system. And um, it's nice to have a type system on top of, no, not only in, in the server implementation, but also in the API itself that we expose to, to the outside world. Um, and type system of GraphQL looks Kind of like this. So this is a human readable representation of uh, a type system. Um, uh, later I will show you how you can actually implement it in Scala. Um, and if you look closely at what, what a type system is and how it looks like, um, here I define a type picture. Uh, and it is, it's a type, so it's kind of an object which has properties, so which has different fields. Uh, this exclamation mark, for example, means that this field is mandatory, so it's not optional. It will, in other words, uh, the value of vice would be always there. So um, on the other hand, URL is uh, an optional field um, in this case. Uh, type system also has interfaces, um, like uh, this identifiable interface. And you can implement inf interfaces in, in types. Um, GraphQL also has a union type, which I haven't shown here. Also, enums. Um, okay, um, so this product, it looks kind of similar to, to a picture. Um, the only difference is, is that picture has actually a size argument. But this argument is optional. That's because you don't see an exclamation mark here. And as you saw before, I can ask for a picture without providing this argument, and I will get default, kind of a default size. But I can also provide an argument, and I will get picture of particular size. Um, and the last type you will see here is, is a product. As you can see, ID is not optional. So you need to always specify a product ID. Um, an interesting thing about a uh, query type uh, is that it's kind of a special type. If you think about it, uh, a GraphQL it has a graph in its name. 
this means that uh, it tries to model um, your uh, server object as a calf, um, but the calf is kind of a data structure that uh, doesn't start or end anywhere. It's just a set of nodes connected to each other with edges. Uh, so in order to traverse a graph, you need to start somewhere. So you need a starting point where you uh, start traversing it and query type, type point. So uh, you those fields that are listed in the query type can be used as a root, um, root query fields uh, in your query. So as you said before, all my queries started with a product or products. Um, OK. so. Um, I want to quickly mention that um, GraphQL is not read-only language. It has also mutations and subscriptions. Um, uh, this, this is an example. I don't want to dive deeper into this, uh, into this feature, uh, but mutation allows you to, to mutate the data. It has exactly the same structure as a query. So you just have fields and arguments, and you can um, select fields on a response. So when this something is updated, like in this case, it's a product. So we change the name of the product. Um, and then we get a product back, but it's updated product. So I can select ID and version after a product was updated. Um, the only difference uh, between mutation and query types, um, uh, queries, is that <clears throat> in mutation, all fields are executed sequentially. Uh, this means that change name would be always executed before the set description. Inquiry, it's a little bit different because you can potentially return a future uh, from a field, and uh, this would mean that fields would be executed in parallel. Uh, subscription is uh, not very fleshed out at the moment. It's still on this uh, design phase, so I will not go deeper into this, but it's meant to be used as um, um, this event mechanism uh, where you can subscribe and to listen for different events happening in the system, and you describe which kind of events are available in your system with a GraphQL type. OK, uh, so, so far, so far, <clears throat> this um, presentation was very non-interactive. I would like to show you an example, uh, a little demo of how you can use GraphQL, uh, how you can build queries. But I would like also to highlight a tool, um, a, small, a small tool that uh, is built on top of GraphQL, uh, and which is called Graphical that you see here. Uh, and this is not a screenshot. You can actually, it's actually interactive. I, I can do something in, in here. It's just embedded here. Uh, it's a, a small HTML JavaScript application. Um, and the thing is, uh, this, this application is completely um, uh, generic, so it has no idea about uh, has uh, have no knowledge about the API. I will uh, talk to it. Only knows the URL of GraphQL endpoint, and this is pretty much it. Um, and we'll see what what it actually capable of doing just based on this URL. And this is something that you can also do, and I'll demonstrate it. So um, let's see. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, nice features about this tool uh, and what it, about its capability is that it has a, an auto completion. So I just press uh, command sh uh, command sh uh, space, and I, I see all of the possibilities that um, I can do with this API on the hero object. For example, I can query APS on uh, APS in, and as you can see, you see the the list of movies um, where this, this particular character appears in, but um, So if you just starting from scratch and you don't know what to do, you can always uh, just use auto completion to, to start something. For example, I can ask for a human, um, and it also has auto completion for all of the arguments. Uh, so uh, with uh, with a description. So for example, uh, here um, you you see um, here not only the type but also a small description of what this property actually does, of which kind of data it can return. Uh, so let's ask for a um, um For example, name and um, ID. Uh, OK, so now if I misspell something, 
it will actually show me that okay this id is not available on a human so it, it is aware of the type system it knows that id um is is um, id one is not available on a human and it knows about the human type and it also knows that a human field that i used here um uh, is uh, of a human type okay so now also let's let us let's ask about a friend of the human and let's also ask for id and name so as you can see you you get um id and name of of this particular um, entity and all of its friends so what i don't like here is that I have ID and name uh, double, so, so I have the duplication of a code. And this is what uh, something that uh, GraphQL allows me to improve. Uh, GraphQL has um, a feature for this that allows to decompose the queries, uh, which is called fragments. So I can define a fragment, I can give it a name, and um, I need to specify on which type um, I would like to query, uh, I would like to this, this fragment to, to work with, uh, uh, to work on. Um, and as you can see, you, you also get nice auto-completion for, for, for this particular fragment. Uh, in this case, I would like to define it on character. Um, I asked for ID and name, and this is pretty much it. So now the only thing remains is, is, uh, is to use it, and I can use it um, like this. So now, um, now, if yeah, so let's add some property. For example, uh, IPSN, and as you can see, um, it gives exactly the same result as, as it did before. So it's a nice way to decompose different queries. And this is, by the way, something that is used in Relay. Um, for example, in Relay, um, you build your React application based on components, and maybe deeply nested components, um, and every component is able to describe its data requirements. Uh, and every every single component is captured inside of a fragment. Then those fragments come together in one big query with with different fragments, and they are uh, exposed here uh, like like this. So, uh, for example, component one, and uh, then we have component two, and so on. So this is pretty much how relay works. Okay, <clears throat> so now, now, now that I've shown you some of the functionality of, of the query itself, you probably wonder, okay, how, how does the tool know about all of those, this information? Because uh, the only thing I've given, uh, given it is, is a URL, URL of uh, my GraphQL server, which is, by the way, Play Application, uh, a simple Play Application that uh, exposes this Star Wars uh, schema. Um, for example, here you may wonder, okay, uh, what, what is the type of this particular property? You, you guess, uh, you probably will guess, but uh, for example, let's take a, a hero. Um, uh, this fragment is unused because it's, com it's compliance. Um, so let's uh, ask for a name. Um, so in order to find out which type of, uh, of an object this is, you can always use uh, a type name. Uh, it available, it's available on all objects. And as you can see here, it's of a type droid. So now type droid, I don't know anything about it, but I can introspect. Um, GraphQL has very powerful introspection API, which is able to describe the whole API. So you can always find out all of the meta information about API together with the actual data. For example, here I can ask a GraphQL server uh, to, to give me uh, the name of uh, the type of, of this particular object. In this case, it's chart. So for example, I can ask for a name and I'll get a chart, nothing, nothing special here, uh, but I can also ask for a field, for example. I can also ask for, for example, uh, arguments of a field. Um, and as you can see, it's nothing interesting here uh, because uh, none of those uh, have actually arguments. Um, 
in in uh, what you can also use uh, is uh, a schema, uh, and schema allows you to access everything there is to know about the API. For example, here um, you can ask for a query type and ask for its name, and it, you, as you can see, it's it's called query. Um, then what you can also, uh, also ask you can ask a lot of different things, but in this case, I would like to know the fields and uh, their names and also the arguments of those fields. Um, and maybe the description. Um, unfortunately, there's no description, but as you can see, you, you see all of the fields that uh, we were able to autocomplete before, like hero, uh, and hero has an episode, and uh, there's a human, <coughs> um, which, which has argument ID. And by the way, this is, Um, here, like a small comparison, it, it shows you precisely the same information. So it shows you that, okay, there is a field, a field hero which has an episode as an argument. Um, and uh, the way it does it, when this whole tool starts up, it makes one very efficient introspection query to, to an API, gives, <clears throat> and then uh, receives a response. Everything there is to know about API, about its uh, metadata, which types are available, uh, what kind of, uh, what what types do those fields have, um, which arguments do they have, and all, all, all of this, this kind of stuff. Okay. <clears throat> um, now you may wonder how you can make this kind of, uh, how, how you can, um, those kind of tools to work with your API, or how you can make uh, your existing application expose a GraphQL endpoint. Um, or do, do you need any kind of particular database, or do you need a particular HTTP library, or something like this? It turns out that um, uh, it turns out that um, GraphQL is completely backend agnostic. Um, for example, you can uh, have your own business logic. You have all your own database. Uh, GraphQL and Sankria, they don't care about uh, database technology that you use, or Uh, or, um, uh, data format to use. For example, you can uh, expose a socket, uh, just a simple TCP connection, and you can send binary data through it. And you still can use GraphQL. So GraphQL can actually, for example, expose, uh, render, uh, produce response uh, in an XML format or in binary format, like uh, binary JSON or something like this. And we will see uh, how, how exactly it works um, in, in a few slides. So what uh, Sangria is uh, a Scala GraphQL implementation, and um, it is open source under Apache 2 license, and it confirms to a GraphQL spec. This means that um, um, all of those aspects about execution and query parsing and uh, introspection API, this is all implemented in Sangria. So you don't need to take care of the, all of those stuff. It can. Um, take a lot of effort to, to, to implement the whole specification to, to be able to pass all those queries that I shown you before. And this is uh, what Sangria can help you with. As soon as you uh, define your schema as um, a set of case classes, so it's just a simple definition. You describe what kind of types you want to expose, uh, which, uh, which kind of fields, and which, what, what type of the fields, and maybe uh, with some descriptions. Um, Sangria able to uh, provide query parsing functionality, query validation, and execution of those queries. Um, and it comes uh, with support of uh, all kinds of different technologies, all kinds of different libraries out of the box. For example, if you're using it with Play, you can use PlayJSON, and uh, there is a PlayJSON support. So as a result of execution, you will automatically get uh, PlayJSON AST. Uh, I think it's called JS value. The spread is it's the same. So you just make another import, and you will get um, different kind of uh, response. And I, I will demonstrate it a little bit later. So uh, in order to use Sangria, first you need to define your schema. So you need to tell it what, what uh, are the types of your API. And in this case, I will define a product that I have shown you before. Um, 
so after the import, I can define a simple case class um, for, for a product, which has just a name, a description for, for simplicity's sake. Um, and then uh, we can define an object type. And this is GraphQL type. It comes from Sangrea. Uh, and uh, this um, object type will describe how to expose this, uh, this particular object, in this case, its product. So we give it a name and some description. And um, then we need to define the fields. And as you can see here, fields um, has two type arguments. Uh, actually, those two type arguments also belong to a product, uh, that to uh, an, an object type. But because of type inference, you don't need to specify it twice, but you can if you want to. And the first one is um, a kind of a context, uh, context value. In this case, it's unit because you don't care about this context object in this particular case. Um, it contains information about a request, for example. Uh, it can, inf uh, can contain information about um, uh, security, like what kind of user you have logged in. Uh, or, uh, for example, it can contain a database connection or kind of a data access object or something like this. But in this case, we don't care. <laughs> we only want to render a product. So this, this is what we define in the second argument. And the second argument uh, generally defines uh, what this object type should um, uh, expose. Uh, so this is a kind of a contextual value object uh, that is uh, meant to be uh, used for in this particular object type. So in our case, it's a product. Um, and uh, we only have two, two fields in the product. So we define a field, a fields themselves, the names of the fields, and their type. As you can see here, the type is, uh, is not a string, like not a scala string, but a string type, which is part of uh, Sangria. It provides um, all different kind of primitive types. Uh, you can also um, create your own, if you wish, for example, things like date uh, or uh, a language or something like this. Um, and you can also use um, different wrapping types, like option type, uh, which is uh, which wraps uh, a string type. And this is a kind of similar what we do in Scala. In Scala, we also use option with a string. And it um, automatically integrates with all those Scala uh, standard types, like option and this and, and so on. Um, and the last thing, but uh, <coughs> by no means, uh, um, uh, the least important uh, is a resolve method, uh, a resolve function. Uh, th this function should be exposed, uh, should, should be defined for all of the fields. So, and this is the place where you bind your application logic to a GraphQL type. So here you can react on this field. So if client asks for a name, for example, this resolve function would be called. And here you can do whatever you want. Um, in this case, this value contains a product. And I just expose a name of the product. But you can have arbitrary logic in here, and uh, as we will see on the next slide. Uh, and the same go for description. Here, I just, just want to give back a description for a product. And this is pretty much it. So this is kind of a simple simple use case uh, for, for a resolve function. Um, now we need to define a schema itself and acquire a type, which is a root type. Uh, in here, it's a little bit simpler because I only have a product, um, but I provide it with different parameters. Because it's a root, a root type, it doesn't have this kind of a value, contextual value, because this is where everything starts, and you don't necessarily have something to start with. So we don't have this, um, this second argument. But on, on the other hand, we need the first argument because we would like to ask a database for a product with particular ID. Um, and this is what, what we provide here. And it's uh, accessible through uh, this uh, CTX property instead of value use uh, context. And, uh, and it contains uh, the object of, of this particular type. And then uh, what you do is And then in resolve function, you can actually go to the database and ask it for, for a product of a particular type. And the result of this function uh, would be given back to, to a product type, as you can see here. So this is what be, would be given as a value to this particular type. So this is where they connect together. Um, and then the last thing that you need to do is to define a schema. And the schema is just a simple case class which uh, has uh, uh, query, where you can provide a query type 
Fujishima a mutation type and subscription type. In this case, we only have query type, so this definition looks looks very very straightforward. So now that you have schema, um, you you need to execute it. Uh, so you need to be uh, be able to um, uh, accept queries and uh, give res uh, responses based on those queries. And this is what what you can do here. So here I. Uh, Shown a simple query, just just the same query that I shown you before, and so Sangeo provides you a nice marker, um, which which will verify the syntax of this uh, query. So if you made some syntactic uh, syntax uh, error, it will uh, it will not compile. So it will show you it, it at the compile time. Uh, that's because it's useful for those kind of small. Uh, examples and it's also very useful for testing, but for um, uh, for real code, you you will uh, you will need to pass this query dynamically, of course. Um, so, given a query, we can execute it uh, with, with this executor, which uh, where you need to provide your schema, your query, and optionally a user context, uh, because we previously use uh, we defined that we need a product repository to execute queries, we need to provide it here. And this is also a nice way to make your your schema definition more functional, because you don't rely on any uh, global state. Uh, you you can actually um, provide it as an argument for the whole execution, and then it would be propagated everywhere for every single type as a second type, uh, type argument, and as this CTX property. Uh, oh, sorry. Which uh, I've uh, shown you before here. Um, okay, so uh, and as you can see here, what we get back as a response is a JS value, and this is a play JSON AST implementation. It works because I imported uh, a play integration. Um, and if you want different kind of response, for example, you want a binary data, or you want uh, you use um, a JSON for S, you can always uh, use different integration. For example, you can just uh, write uh, a JSON for S, native, for instance, uh, and it will give you the value instead of the S value. And this is, this is uh, pretty much how it works. So it's completely type, type class based um, serialization and deserialization of requests and respo uh, responses and uh, variables uh, for, for your uh, execution. Um, and this demonstrates also another important aspect. Um, as you can see here, there is nothing um, specific to HTTP or any kind of technology. So you can execute this query everywhere, for example, in play application, or you can use it in, with Aka HTTP or uh, with your custom TCP server. So as far as Sangre is concerned, uh, uh, you can use anything you want here. And you can also use any kind of format, data format you want. The only requirements to this data format is that it should, so it should support particular primitive values like strings and ints and so on and also maps and list like data structures. Otherwise, you can use whatever you want. Uh, so this is, this is pretty much it on how you can implement it on in your application. So as you can as you saw, it's pretty straightforward. You just define your schema, and uh, then you are ready to go to execute uh, queries against the schema. Um, and um, also, uh, you completely control how it's executed. Uh, you, so you, you define your own uh, kind of uh, behavior for every single field. Um, and you also can embed it in every single, uh, so any kind of application. So you, you can, in previous example, you, you can give this future back to, to a play application, so to, to uh, as a result of play action, and uh, it will be handled by play framework automatically. Um, so just to highlight some additional features that um, Sankaya has and other GraphQL implementations may or may not have, uh, but those features, uh, those are kind of features that are useful for uh, real world applications. So as soon as you start with GraphQL, there are a lot of questions remained 
unanswered. And uh, those features help you uh, to solve uh, issues along the way, or to to kind of help you with this, with um, to 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 implement particular things. For example, deferred values uh, allows you to solve n plus one query problem. For example, if you query a product uh, or a list of products, like in previous examples, uh, it's possible that your product you want to make this kind of a, an expansion, a reference expansion, where every single product produces another query to a database. Ideally, this is something that you uh, want to uh, avoid. So you, you would like, in, in the worst case, you would like to make two queries instead of n plus one queries. And uh, with deferred values, uh, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, Sangre also provides projections, uh, which uh, help you to, to build very efficient database projections. If you think about it, a GraphQL query already has um, uh, has uh, all you need uh, to build those projections um, because client already told you about all of its data requirements. Um, and projection simply makes it very easy for you to, to get all of the fields that <coughs> were asked by client and um, build um, maybe a, a, a database projection out of it. So <coughs> Sanke also has a, a middleware. A middleware um, it's kind of an ins instrumentation of a query, so it allows you to um, intercept every single field execution and do something useful about it. For example, uh, you can implement security primitives uh, on top of it, where you just reject a field if user does not have some particular permission. Uh, or you can also measure performance uh, for every single field execution. Um, Sangre also provides the query reducers, uh, which is also um, becomes very helpful, especially uh, when you think about it. Um, GraphQL uh, provides much uh, provides much more freedom than, uh, for example, REST API, where in REST you kind of have very predictable um, performance, so you know what, uh, for example, client asks for a list of products, and you know, okay, it will not get more complex. Uh, than just to fetch a list of products from a database. But if you get a GraphQL query, it can contain a list of products, a list of orders, an inventory, and all kinds of stuff. It also can have uh, recursive data structures, which potentially can be easily abused. And query reducers help you to solve this kind of problems. Um, what query reducer does, it, it provides you, so it allows you to analyze a query even before it gets executed. Uh, this means um, you, you can reduce the whole query to a single value and then make some um, validation for this value. This is how built-in uh, query complexi uh, complexity measurement works. It reduces the whole query into a single value, which you can then uh, assert on. For example, you can define a threshold that complexity of a query shouldn't be greater than a particular number. <clears throat> and you can customize uh, this number for every single field or if, if, it's a, if it's a list field, you can calculate a complexity based on number of arguments, mm -hmm. or mac, um, uh, the, the maximum size of, of uh, a list or something like this. So it's a very flexible mechanism to, to measure complexity and to guard your API from, from abuse. Um, so on this note, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope it gave you a little bit uh, more information about GraphQL, why it's useful, and how you can use it in your applications, CSQL applications. Um, here are some links. Um, the, the first one is uh, the link to this print. Oh. Um, yeah, OK. As you saw, it's, it's a link to, to, this, to the same presentation. <laughs> uh, let's go then. Uh, not yet. Um, then this is my Twitter account, and uh, there are some links to GraphQL, Sangria, and uh, some kind of GitHub repository. Um, and the last thing, I highly recommend you to check it out because um, this is a simple play application. Um, it looks like this. Um, here you can execute some queries, like, like here, for example. Uh, it can also have, you can also experiment with different examples, uh, like, for example, this one. Or like, uh, this is a full introspection. It's very, very big. <laughs> uh, and here, as you can see, it, it has a lot of stuff going on. So this is uh, like uh, everything there is to know about this API. Like every single type is described, every single description is in there, and so on. 
So you, you can experiment with with the queries themselves. Uh, at the bottom, you can also find uh, a little bit of information how you can can uh, clone this repository and try it out yourself locally. It's very easy to do, and uh, you, you just git clone this particular repository, uh, just change into this folder, and you start this play application. And then you can hack, hack on it and try with different schemas, uh, with different fields and arguments yourself. Uh, and you will see results immediately in, in this view. It also provides you with uh, this graphical tool that I showed you before. So as you can see, it provides you, uh, you, you can execute queries. So it's uh, <laughs> the same query as uh, I say, edited in, in presentation because this, this tool actually saves uh, queries in, in the local storage. Uh, you can view documentation, and this this documentation is now outdated uh, because it's retrieved directly from the API. API is self-descriptive. Um, uh, just a second. So I hope you enjoyed it, and if you have any questions, and if we have some time, <laughs> because I went a little bit over time, I guess, uh, I would be happy to answer. Hey, Oleg, that was great. Can you hear us? I can hear the echo, so I know. So thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. If anybody has any questions, has any questions pass, pass, pass around the mic and hear your question. Anybody? Okay, Scala JS. Um, yeah, this is question actually asked a lot. Um, the problem with uh, um, at the moment, uh, I try to concentrate on the main functionality, and there's a lot to be done uh, with the main library. Uh, in future, I definitely want to look at SkyJS. Uh, the thing is that Sangria itself is pretty much centric on the service server side. So you implement Yoshima um, on on the server. Uh, well, where uh, Scala JS can come into play and can be very useful is to build tools like Graphical, for example, or to make something interesting on, on the client side with data, uh, or for example, with, with a class generation or Scala, uh, so integration with SBT and all, the, all this kind of stuff. So I definitely want to check it out. Um, but at the moment, um, like I said, I try to focus on the main library. So I would like to make library useful and uh, good and Okay, thank you. Okay. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? No? All right, let's give a hand for Oleg. So, right. thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me today. It was very nice. Yeah, thanks for uh, accepting the invite at a short notice. I really appreciate that. And cool. feel free to stay on the call, and I think you'll be able to hear our next speaker uh, if you do. But uh, if not, we'll talk to you later. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. All right, see you later.